This Week with Bob Mueller on News 2. This week... It's one year since Russia's unprovoked assault on Ukraine. One year of Ukrainians losing their homes, their livelihoods, too many losing their lives. And we have Russians attacking Kiev again. It's also one year of former Tennessean Christina Katrakis providing hope, aid, and love. There is no excuse why not to support Ukraine right now. A return visit to Ukraine as we hear from UN aid worker Christina Katrakis. I'm the only foreign ambassador from the Foundation for United Nations who willingly chose to stay here with her family and a six-year-old son, you know, risking our lives, but staying here to the end to help these people. Because I think that's what being an American is. Hello again and welcome to another edition of this year, a year, this week. A year has passed since Russia began a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands dead and millions of Ukrainians displaced, including a quarter of a million now living in the U.S. We begin with a look back at the year of destruction. One year since the first Russian missiles hit Kyiv. <laughs> Ukrainian President Zelensky speaking to media from around the world. He says if the international community keeps its word about help and aid, Ukraine will definitely win. President Biden today announcing a $2.5 billion aid package for Ukraine and sweeping new sanctions against Russia. He also met with G7 leaders and Zelensky in a virtual meeting. The United Nations overwhelmingly approved a resolution calling for Russia to withdraw forces. Seven countries voted against it, 32 abstained, including India and China. President Biden speaking tonight in an exclusive interview with World News anchor David Muir. You announced another $2.5 billion in aid to Ukraine today, $113 billion now. We know the vast majority of Americans support Ukraine. But there are now many who are asking, how long can we spend like this? Well, first of all, I'm not sure how many are asking. I know the mega crowd is. The, the right-wing Republicans are, you know, talking about we can't do this. You find ourselves in a situation where the cost of doing, of walking away, could be considerably higher than the cost of helping Ukraine maintain its independence. We know the Germans are now sending tanks in after the U.S. said it would send Abrams tanks as well. But we know President Zelensky continues to say what he really needs are F-16s. Will you send F-16s? Look, we're sending him what our seasoned military thinks he needs now. He needs tanks. He needs artillery. He needs air defense, including another HIMARS. There's things he needs now that we're sending him to put him in a position to be able to make gains this spring and this summer going into the fall. You don't think he needs F-16s now? No, he doesn't need F-16s now. Amid concerns China could start providing weapons to Russia, China today calling for a ceasefire and providing a proposal to end the conflict. Zelensky in response saying that China talking about Ukraine is, quote, not bad. Lindsay Watts, ABC News, Washington. Russia's desperate attempts to conquer the East met with fierce resistance. Here, Russian tanks crossed Ukraine's frozen landscape and then obliterated in a huge cloud of smoke. <laughs> Heavy losses on both sides in the battle for Bakhmut. More than 70,000 lived here before the war. Now, there's almost nothing left. This as Belarus President Lukashenko, Putin's closest ally, met with President Xi in Beijing. There are growing fears that China may seek to arm Russia. The two men touted China's 12-point plan for peace, a proposal which doesn't say Russian troops should leave Ukraine. Putin is preparing to host Xi in Moscow this spring. And today, Secretary Blinken saying there is zero evidence that Putin was ready to engage in serious peace talks. And tonight, Ukraine is rushing reinforcements to Bakhmut. They're keen to show the world that they will not retreat. James Longman, ABC News in eastern Ukraine. Now to our This Week cover story. Former Tennessean Christina Katrakis, Ukrainian by birth, has provided aid, comfort and hope to Ukrainians since the war began. She is an international coordinator and curator, writer, artist and ambassador for the Foundation for United Nations SDG. Christina Katrakis joins us from Kyiv, but first, a look inside Ukraine. One year after the Russian assault on Ukraine, 
and the country has become unrecognizable. Roads are filled with bomb craters. Neighborhoods are gone, abandoned. Only empty, decaying shells remain of what were homes to families, neighborhoods, communities. The snow covers the landscape that is brown from winter and from attack by rockets and bombs. There are no people along the roads, no commuters. People are inside, making candles for the night. Inside, hoping the next bombs dropped don't hit their home. The daylight reveals the carnage, the true destruction caused by Russia in its undeclared war on Ukraine. But it's at night when the true nature of the situation is revealed. Revealed in the darkness. A few headlights on the road. A few generators light a few windows. Most buildings are dark, vacant, abandoned. Most businesses are closed, deserted. Inside, you find Ukrainians surviving however they have to. Battery or kerosene lanterns for light. Kerosene space heaters for warmth. The candle provides the ability to see, for children to read by candle, to eat by candle. To sing by candle. And to sing in the dark. All the Ukraine is singing Ukrainian anthem right now at, at night. That's New Year's already begun and Russians are bombing us and all our neighbors are singing Ukrainian anthem in the dark. This is Ukrainian spirit. This is Ukraine, one year into the Russian invasion, one year of homelessness for millions, one year of fleeing refugees, one year of providing some kind of hope and help and love by people like Kristina Katrakis, who with her family refuses to leave Ukraine, despite the ever-present danger, despite death in the air, despite fear. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment. Welcome back to This Week. I am pleased to be joined by my friend, national photojournalist David Van Hooser, and live from Ukraine via Skype, Christina Katrakis, ambassador for the Foundation for United Nations SDG. We've been following Christina's heroic work for more than a year now. It is so good to see you both. Thank you. Thank Hope you you're doing well, Christina. Thank you. We, thank you. So good to see you, Bob and David, and congratulations oh, thank you. on the Emmy Award for <laughs> teamwork. It was very much teamwork. Tennessee rocks. Right. It was your story. I, I have to start, Christine. I have to ask you, with the increased force of Russia, it's becoming more and more escalated. What's the fear there in Russia? Is, is, is You've been through this a year now. It's been horrendous. It's been death around you. But does this seem like one of the most dangerous times so far? Well, right now, Bob, as we're speaking, we have air sirens on. So the alert is on and we have Russians attacking Kiev again. We're in Kiev right now. And uh, it's already a fourth air alarm during one day. So you can imagine what we're going through and uh, kids in the bunker while I'm giving this, you know, <laughs> makeshift place interview. Uh, but 
that's a reality that people live in. And uh, since Russians did not uh, achieve anything in the front lines, did not achieve the goal of uh, taking over Kiev during the winter that they were planning, uh, they're going to try to bomb Ukraine as much as possible. And that's what they've been doing this week. You know, they've started like on Monday and they haven't stopped since, you know. You've been providing so, um, aid to Ukrainians for more than a year now, helping refugees helping homeless folks there. The resiliency is truly unbelievable. But I have to ask you, you, your family, the people of Ukraine, are you not just emotionally exhausted from this, t this past year? Bob, I'm very exhausted. My family is very exhausted, you know. But, you know, as, as we said, we have no choice. Our only choice is bravery because, you know, we, we crossed the Rubicon. You know, we we are on the blacklist of Russia. We are on the blacklist of terror. And we chose light. And that's what we're going to stand for until the end. And, you know, my uh, seven-year, now seven-year-old Mark, he was six when the war started, right? So he says that, he dreams to go to the sea. That's all he dreams of. He dreams to see the sea, you know, the ocean, whatever, water, you know. And he said, Mom, we have to win this war so we could go to the sea. I want to see the sea. I want to see the dolphins, you know. <laughs> that, that's that's the basics of what children dream of other than having light, you know, and Internet and, you know, things that people are used to. Normality. But, um, right. What, what is normal to everybody in Tennessee, to y'all, it's not normal here, you know, and, and people and kids especially, they, they sense that the most, like when you have hot water in the shower and you can take a shower or you have light or you can watch a, a cartoon or you can, you know, they have something to play with, sure. you know, toys and things like that. So it's, it, it breaks your heart, but it kind of, you know, brings you down to things. You know, we started playing family games and old stuff, <laughs> old school stuff with candles, and that kind of bonded us more. I'm very glad, looking back at the year, I'm very glad that we stayed, and I'm very gl glad that we we're together, that we didn't separate in any way, and I'm glad that my little Mark made that decision on the, like, third day of the war, he said, Mom, you know, we're not going anywhere. We're sticking together. We're doing this. And you guys are brave. Christina, kind of, what, I have to ask, yeah. what was the reaction? What was the reaction of the people you spoke with when President Biden made his unannounced visit to Ukraine and we heard the, the, the air raid sirens going as he's walking with President Zelensky? Well, that was that was incredible. You know, that was kind of a beautiful gesture of friendship and unity that we need right now, most of all. But also people here need aid and they need military aid and they need it fast so they could cover the skies so that kids right now wouldn't get bombed by uh, Russian pilots and by Russian missiles and by Russian drones, Iranian drones, actually. And now they're planning to buy Chinese drones, as you say. Uh, so, um, <laughs> you know, we need it as fast as possible so that Ukraine could at least take care of itself, but also have this comradeering spirit of having shoulder to shoulder stand for what is true, what is democracy and what is light. Christina, do you still uh, communicate a lot with your Verokta base in Western Ukraine? I know that's where you and your family went to when the war began. That's where you established your work began there. Right. And I was just wondering if you're still able to commute back and forth with there. Do you go there often? And, and, and what is that still that's still operating, right? Your octopus. David, I'm like an octopus. It must be my Greek blood, you know. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, 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 I'm communicating with all our branches and all our little groups of volunteers helping us. And Roman is a crisis coordinator that does the amazing job every day, really. He and the team makes the impossible possible daily. So the Verokta team is working hard. Everything is in place, as you've seen it before, even yes. better. Uh, we now have an um, invincibility point uh, that we provided thanks to our program, um, Power to Ukraine and Be the Light, uh, so that we pr the money was raised uh, through our ambassadors of light, uh, Charles Miller, Olana Hness, um, Marina Marchenko, uh, then people can have 
uh, power stations, generators, rechargeable lights, and we've tried to provide them to as many points as possible. Of course, the funds were limited. We raised somewhat more, a little sure. bit more above uh, 10,000. But you're doing for God's that work, money, Christina. You're doing God's work. And right. You're for that lives. money, we were able to provide electricity to the front lines and to internally displace people. So now people, even when we have no light, they can charge their phones, they can charge their lights and uh, bring their kids to our storage while they're looking for things they need. They can charge everything and go home and be able to communicate, be able to have a light. So that's important. And our we conversation with Christina Katrakis will continue just in a moment as this week continues. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this week in our conversation with national photojournalist David Van Hooser and Christina Katrakis, who is joining us live from Ukraine. Christina, I have to ask you personally, it's been a year for your family. How are you, your husband, your son, how is your family doing with the stress of what you've been through and with the hard work you've been through? These are long hours, no electricity, no water for a while, no heat for a while. Your family has been put through a lot of stress. Well, it's the first day of spring. Um, God is there, right? <laughs> what an attitude. <laughs> we, sur we survived it, right? We survived it against all odds. And because of our project, Power to Ukraine and Be the Light, that David was actually part of and did the promos for that we did for Christmas with y'all as well, uh, we were able to raise funds to help hundreds of people at the front lines and internally displaced to get electricity, to get power. Right now, we're expecting... 250 heaters, you wow. know, gas heaters that people can use in their houses without electricity to heat their homes because we don't know how long this war will go on and, you know, the spring may still be cold. So this is something really important. And our partners are really pulling through and we're very grateful to everyone who has pitched in. We help lots of medics, paramedics at the front lines who are saving lives daily provided them with ventilators, provided them with power stations for their rescue uh, cars, ambulance cars, right? So they could have electricity right. while delivering a patient to Chris, the hospital. Christina, and, let me, let me, many more things. Let me ask you about my friend Mark, your son, seven-year-old <laughs> Mark, who I befriended. We became close friends when, and still are. Um, he, he can't, I know you talked a little bit earlier about it, but he, he doesn't, his life's disrupted as far as there's no, is there school, no school? I mean, just the basics of what children do. You don't go to the playground, you don't go to school. Tell me just a little bit about how he's doing. It's devastating. And, you know, Mark loves you. Yeah. You know, you're one of those favorite, favorite people in the whole universe. <laughs> you know? he, he always asks about you. And when he sees a character on TV that speaks Southern, he says, that sounds like Dave. Oh, well, okay. And I'm like, oh, gosh. <laughs> so now every cowboy, every Southern guy <laughs> is David Van <Matt> Hooser. <laughs> but <Okay. laughs> regardless of that, you know, we lost the school. You know, uh, the Russians attacked on New Year's Eve, uh -huh. as you remember, yeah. uh, and destroyed Mark's school in the heart of Kiev. And so his school is gone, his bomb shelter is gone, and we're still having no classes. So the only classes we have are online classes. So he doesn't actually have any communication with kids. And that's really tough for Mark because, as you know, he's very, he's a social he's creature. He's a social, and, yes, and, yes. <laughs> Christina, I have, to, I have to ask you, I have to ask you, you see what's happening. There's been a little bit of, of resilience, or on, I mean, a lot of resilience from the folks of Ukraine. And here in the United States, there's been just a lot of support to bring aid. But some of that, some of that support is beginning to wane a little bit. Some folks are saying maybe we shouldn't give as much money to Ukraine. What is your message to America as far as what this aid is doing for your country? And what do you still need as this war continues? Well, my message is simple as that. This is not Ukraine's war, just as Poland was not in war with Nazis, okay? So when Germans moved in into Poland and everybody was watching that happening during the World War II, it was not Polish war with Germany. It was world's war against terror. And right now, Ukrainians are shielding 
the rest of the world, the rest of the Western world, including U.S., with their own bodies, both at the front lines and with the kids who live here, including Mark, who's an American. And there are many Americans, volunteer Americans at the front lines that we communicate with, and I know that for sure, that understand that very well, and they came here to stand for what is right, right? So there is no excuse why not to support Ukraine right now. You know, you had no excuse when you went to Iraq. We went to, because I'm an American. We went to Iraq. We went to Afghanistan. We stood for what is right. We were not afraid of weapons of mass destruction. We were not afraid of terror. We were standing for what is democracy. We were not afraid to go to, to Serbia to combat genocide, right? Christina, I think right you now have we a, have genocide. Right now we have... Uh, possibility of nuclear, and right now we have terror, a state of terror yeah. going against the Western world. So this is the right time to step in and defend and go shoulder to shoulder like we used to do in World War II, standing for what is right. Maybe Chris I'm crazy, but I believe in Captain America. Okay? Christine, I do think you have an ally in President Biden, and I think aid will continue in some form. Hopefully, it will continue and that this war will come to a peaceful end and Ukraine will come out victorious. We look forward to talking to you again. Our time has run out, but my friends, stay safe. Continue your heroic efforts. You're saving lives. Stay with us. This week continues in a moment. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. That will do it for another edition of This Week. I want to thank my guest, former Tennessean aid worker Christina Katrakis for joining us from Ukraine, and photojournalist David Van Huser for joining us here in studio. Hope to see you back here next weekend for another edition of This Week.